All right, so this video is going to serve as kind of a practice uh, before your EQAO grade nine math exam. So yeah, let's get straight into it. So our first question here states this, what is a simplified form of this expression? So here we have two X and inside of brackets, you have X squared minus three X plus two. So the first thing that I would wanna do here is I want to consider the distributive property. So this 2x is going to get distributed to this x squared, and then it's going to get distributed to this 3x, minus 3x, and it's getting distributed to this plus 2. So let's do the math. So let's just write this out one more time. So we have the 2x, and then we have x squared minus 3x plus 2. Now let's use distribution distributive property. 2x times x squared. What is that? That is going to be 2x cubed. So that kind of gets rid of these two options for us directly. And then we have 2x times a negative 3x, right? 2x times a negative 3x is going to be negative 6x squared. So at this point, you could potentially just circle D. But what I want to do, I just want to finish the question, right? What's 2x times 2? We're going to get plus 4x. And that is it for this question over here. And so our answer should be D. In a game, a participant moves a game piece around a board. The participant will receive 100 points if the game piece stops at a blue box. So if it's if our if if the person stops at a blue box, we're going to get 100 points. Um, it does, and we'll lose 50 points if the game piece stops on a yellow box. So if, if it's yellow, I'm gonna put this, I'm gonna use orange because you can't really see much of yellow. But if it's yellow then we're going to uh, lose 50, okay? I'm gonna put Y and I'm gonna name this B, just so it looks a little neater, all right? And it says, which expression represents the participant's total score after completing the game? I'd say this is more of a thinking question and you should be able to solve this relatively quickly because it's a thinking question, right? So of course, you're gonna be gaining 100 if you land on a blue box. So 100B is definitely part of our equation here and it says we're going to be losing 50 so let's subtract 50 and if we land on a yellow box so our answer shouldn't be you know something to do with addition here with 50 right but rather it should be this one which is 100 B minus 50 Y you know it can't be 100 when you when you're on yellow right so it can't be this one it can't be a right because you're adding it so it's reasonable to say that our answer should be B right so again, if you guys want to pause it, try again, try again, try it again yourself. Go ahead, yeah, and we're gonna move on to the next question now. All right, so for a third problem here, the question says, which algebraic expression represents the area of this composite shape? So this question may look a little bit tricky, but it's actually pretty straightforward. So the first thing I would kind of want to do is separate this into shapes that I know of to calculate the area of, right? I know how to calculate the area of rectangles, squares, or triangles, right? So when I see that these type of questions, that's what I do. So here, it looks like I can make two rectangles here, two very nice, you know, it's not really looking nice, but I can kind of understand that this, this is going to be a rectangle and this is going to be a rectangle. So I can create two areas here. So I'm going to make this a blue one here and I'm going to make an orange area, okay? Two areas. I'm going to first find my blue area, right? And we know the formula for a rectangle, right? It's a perfect, good-looking rectangle. And that is basically going to be uh, base times height, right? Or length times width. I'm going to do length times width. So it's length times width. Here, our length is 7x plus 1. What's our width going to be? 4x, right? It's not going to be 5x because it's including this portion, right? But for this little, uh, our big rectangle here, our length is going to be 7x plus 1 and our width is going to be 4x. So let's do that. It's going to be, I'm going to rewrite this so I can use distributed property a little better. I'm going to write it like this. All right. So it's going to be 4x when you distribute a property again. Distribute this 4x here and then distribute it over here. So it's going to become <clears throat> what's 4 times uh, 7. We should know that this is equal to 28x squared and then we have plus 4x. All right, so now we've got the area of the blue shape here. Now we need to find the area of the orange shape. Now, students can get stuck here. Like, what do I, how do I find this uh, width over here? But it's fairly simple. It's just, I find out this, this entire length uh, width here is 5x. If I want those little 
width, then I'll just do uh, this entire width, subtract this little width, and it should give me the difference between them. All right, so let's do that. So 5x minus 4x is equal to just x. All right, so now let's find the area, just like we did. I'm gonna write it right here, orange area. And let's do this, so it's going to be x multiplied by 3x plus one. And using distributive property again, I distribute that over there. So then it becomes 3x squared plus x. All right, so now we've got both of our little sub areas here. We got this one over here and this one over here. Now what remains is just one single step, which is to add these two areas up together. Okay, so let's do that. I'm gonna do this in black over here. I'm gonna do final area. And it should match with one of the answers given to us here. So it's going to be 28x squared plus 4x plus 3x squared plus x. And if we put the like terms together, it becomes 28x squared plus 3x squared plus 4x plus x. So it becomes what? 31x squared plus 5x. And that is it. This is our final area. And we can see if this matches with any of our answers given to us. And yes, it does. It matches with A. And that's how you can solve this one. All right, so our next question states this. This table shows the relationship between the distance an object travels and time. All right, so let's look at both our time and distance here. So our time is going up by one second, as we can see here. It's going from zero to one to two to three, right? And our distance is going up by what? Zero to 1.5, which is a difference of 1.5. And then it's going up by another 1.5, right? To 3.0 and another 1.5. If you can't find this value right here, just subtract. That's what I would do, right? Subtract um, three from 4.5, right? or 1.5 from 3. And it says it's a it's you know a constant rate of change, right? That means the object isn't going to be, you know, traveling faster than 1.5 meters per second, right? So we can write over on the left hand side that our rate of change right it's a ratio. So I'm going to write this 1.5 meters per second. All right? So that's the rate of change. And now with this we can find what distance it travels in five seconds. Now, we don't have to extend our chart to four and then, you know, do it, but we can, all we just have to do is just plug in five to get our answer here. So it's just going to be five multiplied by 1.5 meters per second and should give us our answer. Now, if you can't use a calculator, all you have to do is 1.5 multiplied by five, five times five, 25, five, and then plus two, 7.5. So our answer to this question is 7.5 meters. And that's it for this one. We have a graph analysis question which states, which line has a slope of negative 4 over 5 and a y-intercept of 6? So the first thing that I would want to do is find my y-intercept. The y-intercept is basically a point where our x value is equal to 0, right? So yeah, let's do that. Uh, another way to think about it is also, where is our line intercepting the y-axis? For some, that's easier to understand. So let's find it. Let's see if any of these graphs have 6. So for A, we can see that it is indeed 6, so we can keep it for now. Uh, B, we can see that it is 6 here, so we can keep it. Remember, this is the y-axis, guys. Remember that. Uh, for C, it's not 6, so we can cross it out. And then for D, we have A, we can see that it's not 6, so we can cross that out as well. So all we need to calculate the slope for is A and B. And it's kind of a 50-50 chance. If you say the slope is correct for A, then go ahead and circle it, and you're good to go. But if you, if you get B, if you calculate B and it's wrong, then you know it has to be A. All right, so let's do A, all right? So the formula for the slope, it's good to always know the formula, right? It's basically Y2 over Y1 uh, divided by uh, X2 minus X1. I may have said Y2 over Y1. It's not Y2 over Y1. It's Y2 minus Y1 over X2 minus X1. All right, so what does this formula even mean? Our, basically, we're gonna be looking at two points and we're gonna be figuring out the slope between these two points. And these are just the X and Y coordinates of my two points. So again, you can skip ahead if you already know how to find the slope and remember you can pause the video and answer the question on your own. So you're free to do that. So let's do this. So let's look at two points that we know exist on this line over here. First point, it's already kind of given to us is five, and two, 
So we have the point 5, 2. Remember our x uh, comes first and then our y. Right here, x, y. And then we have the point 0, 6, which we know exists. It's perfect because we're, we know that there's a y-intercept, right? So it's there. So it's going to be my x1, it's going to be my x2, it's going to be y1, it's going to be my y2. All right? So now we're going to do this. It's going to be equal to y2, which is 6, minus y1, which is 2. And then it's going to be over uh, x2, which is uh, 0, and then minus uh, x1, which is 5. And this is going to be equal to 4 over negative 5, which is equal to negative 4 over 5. It's basically the same thing. All right, so we found our answer here, and does it have a slope of negative four over five? Yes, it does, and a y-intercept of six? Yes, it does, so our answer is going to be A. All right, so this question here states this. An ice cream company wants to be able to predict the number of ice cream treats that will be sold each day. Which piece of information would be least helpful to collect for the company to make this prediction? So A says day of the week. So day of the week would be important, right? Because this is the important part of the question that I'm just going to highlight over here. It says, I want to be able to predict the number of ice cream treats that can be well be sold each day, right? So just connect the ideas here. It's a logical thinking question, right? Yet it is a little bit tricky to understand. Okay, so let's look at it. Remember, let's get back to the point here. So day of the week. So do you think it's important to understand uh, if they sold more ice cream on Monday or then Sunday or if they were selling more ice cream on Thursday and Saturday, yes, it is, right? It's important because that's really relative. It's asking us, um, predict the number of ice cream treats that would be sold each day. So the day of the week is 100% important and, uh, you know, this is least helpful, right? So A is definitely helpful, definitely on top of important. Um, B says average daily temperature. Now, when it comes to ice cream, right, ice cream melts in hot temperature, right? And sometimes maybe people might be craving it on a warmer day, right? So I feel like temperature is definitely a factor to the number of ice cream treats that can be sold each day. So I'm definitely going to keep that there, right? Um, past daily sales of ice cream treats. Now, past daily sales of ice cream treats can definitely be considered an important factor uh, to predicting the number of ice cream treats that will be sold each day, as if we predict that um, since we sold maybe uh, 100 ice creams on Saturday, then we can potentially come close to that next Saturday as well, right? Or we can make like an rough estimates with this idea here. We could definitely keep that. Now D says this, cost of packaging of the ice cream treats. Now something immediately feels a little bit wrong, right? Cost of packaging of the ice cream treats. What does the cost of packaging the ice cream treats have to do with predicting the number of ice cream treats that will be sold each day? The cost of packaging has nothing to do with some um, number of things to be sold, right? It's not literally a factor. If anything, this has to do with manufacturing, right? So I feel like the least helpful to collect the, uh, sorry, least piece of uh, information that would be least helpful to collect for the company would be D, right? And that's just a logical thinking question. Question over here says, what is the value of X in this diagram? So we can see X over here. I've put a little blue mark over there. It's, we're just looking for this angle X, all right? And they've given us two other angles. They've given us angle of 128 and an angle of 103 over here. Something important to understand is that if we have a straight line, right, and if we measure the angle there, it's 180 degrees, right? Another thing to know is that the internal angles of a triangle is going to add up to 180 degrees. So this angle over here, this x, plus this angle over here, plus this angle over here, will give you uh, our a total angle of 180 degrees. All right, so I need to find this angle over here. I'm going to call this phi, and then I'm going to call this over here theta. So I'm going to find theta and phi. In order to find phi, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do 180 degrees subtract 103 degrees. Now, why am I doing this over here? Why am I doing 180 subtract 103 degrees? Because this entire angle over here from this bottom area to this thing is, a, is 180 degrees. Then to know this little blue part, all I do is I do a 180 subtract 103. All right, and if we do our calculation, 180 subtract 103 is equal to 77 degrees. So this angle over here, we can replace the phi to 77 degrees. Now remember, phi is just a Greek letter 
that can represent an angle for us okay nothing more nothing less don't get any uh, don't get worried about it. it's just like saying X or Y or Z all right now let's move to theta theta again is just another representation like like X B N it's just a variable all right we're gonna do the same thing over here since we know this entire angle over here is 180 degrees we're gonna do 180 degrees subtract 128 so 180 degrees subtract 128 degrees all right so that should give us an answer of 52 degrees. Right, so this angle over here, I'm gonna replace with 52 degrees. Now we know that the internal angles, like I said before, add up to 180 degrees, and we're trying to find this X value over here. So to do this, what we're gonna do is we're gonna do 180 degrees, subtract 52 degrees plus 77 degrees. So let's do this. So it's going to be 180 degrees, so we're going to add 52 and 77 together, which gives an answer of, um, which gives an answer of 129. So it's going to be 180 degrees, subtract 129 degrees, and this is going to give us an answer of 51 degrees, and that is going to be our final answer. I'm going to highlight that in pink, and we can see if any of our options match with this. We can see that A matches, so that is going to be your answer. That is it to solving this. Uh, I hope this video helped, and good luck on your exams.